And uh, today I will talk briefly about Animal Welfare Group Nigeria with the acronym AWGN. My name is uh, Samuel Drosharo. I work with the Department of Animal Breeding and Genetics, Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokuta, Ogun State, Nigeria. I am also a postdoctoral fellow, fellow at the Department of uh, Animal Sciences, Purdue University, West Lafayette in Indiana, United States. So Animal Welfare Group Nigeria uh, comprises our postgraduate students, lecturers, and researchers. And uh, if you look at all these pictures, in 2019, we had our maiden meeting. Uh, this is a uh, uh, biotechnology lab of animal breeding and genetics, FUNAP. And uh, this uh, is Dr. Yas. I don't know if people can see my cursor. Yes, we can. Yeah, good. This is Dr. Yase presenting some talks. Uh, I can recognize some few people here. This is Dr. Uh, Majakudumi. And uh, in these pictures, uh, these are the lecturers uh, the, that were involved. This is me, Dr. Yase, Dr. Dele. Uh, this is Mrs. Miriam Logunleko. This is Dr. Abioja. That is the head of department, uh, uh, Department of Physiology, FUNAB. And this is uh, Mrs. Emanuela Ingosu. Then this uh, is the picture that we took with uh, the student in the college, College of Animal Science and Livestock Production. Uh, so Animal Welfare Group, you can see us on Twitter uh, at AWGM14. Then our Facebook and LinkedIn name is Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. Then uh, we also have a YouTube channel called Animal Welfare Group Nigeria, where you can watch uh, some past webinars and some other activities that we have done. So what are our missions? Uh, the first one is to increase awareness about animal behavior and welfare in Nigeria, Africa, and the world at large. And this is what we do uh, by hosting so many webinars. I can tell you that in the last two years, we have had 33 webinars. And that is not all you see us posting so many things on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, we want people to know about animal welfare and behavior. The second mission is to foster collaboration and networking among researchers who are in the field of animal behavior and welfare. So we do this a lot and we have a lot of our members that are spread all over the world. I mean, the United States, uh, Dr. Yasseri is in Germany, uh, Miriam Dogunleko is in University of Bristol in the United Kingdom, uh, Ojela Adishon is in the uh, University of Glasgow. A lot of people. And uh, we work with some other researchers. You will see some, uh, some work done by Dr. Yasseri and some other researchers in the world. The same thing, uh, I also collaborate with some other researchers in the world. And the last one is that we are trying to educate the public on the importance of animal welfare. So we do this in so many ways. Through our webinars, posting on LinkedIn, posting on Twitter, posting on Facebook. I think the only thing we don't have yet is uh, a radio and TV station, which we are going to get later in life. So in 2021, these are the title slide of some of our webinars. And this we have in 2021, mm. we have 19 webinars. You can see the one by uh, Valentine, by myself, by uh, Ajayi Oriolua, who is uh, Dr. Yasseri's and my uh, postgraduate student. Then uh, this one is from uh, Canada. This one is from Portugal. This one is from Switzerland. This one is from Netherlands. This is Dr. Yasseri's presentation. Like Dr. Yasseri is from Nigeria. This is from uh, Narayan. Narayan is in uh, Australia. Uh, this is from Mona. Mona from uh, Netherlands. This is from uh, Suriya. Suriya is from uh, Malaysia. This is from Tom Smuda. Tom Smuda is in uh, Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. And this is from uh, University of Guelph in Canada. Uh, this is from uh, Kate Lewis, Kate Lewis in the United Kingdom. And this is from uh, JNU. So these are the 19 uh, webinars in year 2021. In 2022, with Okwemi Sports uh, presentation, we have uh, 14. This is from uh, Christian Narot in Germany. Uh, this is from uh, 
This is from people in the Netherlands. This is my presentation. This is Victor. Victor is our postgraduate student. This presentation, uh, this is a lovely one by Dr. Yasseri that talk about vocalization in uh, in uh, in chicken. It was it. We learned a lot of things when she presented this. And this is from Richard Miller. Richard is working on a uh, cognition in many beds. Uh, this presentation is about dog. The 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 gifted dog project uh, uh, from uh, Hungary, and this presentation is by Charles Mason. So not only webinars, uh, we, if, if I want to go, if I want to summarize what we have done so far about our webinars, uh, we have presentations from Nigeria, Canada, Switzerland, Portugal, uh, Australia, Malaysia, United Kingdom, United States, Hungary, and Germany, and in the, 2021, we have six presentations from Nigeria. Uh, 2022, we have six presentations from Nigeria and 12 in the two years. And uh, we also have a lot of presentations from Canada, four in uh, 2021, one in 2022, and five in all. And if you want to go by uh, presenters' affiliation, we don't only deal with uh, people in university, we deal with people in association and uh, research institute. Uh, in 2021, 18 people uh, that have affiliation with the university presented. Uh, in 2022, 12 people that have affiliation with the university presented. Then in 2022, uh, we have uh, people that also presented from research uh, institute. And out of all these, in 2021, we have uh, 19 uh, webinars. 2022, we have 14, making a total of 33. Then we also have inaugural lectures. Uh, for our inaugural lectures, we call scientists, prominent scientists, to come and talk about our, uh, our topical issues. So we have three in 2021 and three in 2022, making six in all. And we also have a panel discussion. This was so uh, educative. We are we discuss some issues that. Uh, related to animal welfare, the issue of using animals for game, uh, castration, and some other things. And by if you look at the category of presenters, uh, we have uh, in 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 all the presentations, we have ten postgraduate students that have presented. We have twenty one researchers, and we have one uh, teacher slash auditor. So these at the title slide of the virtual inaugural lectures. The first one was by Emeritus Professor Donald Bloom from University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Uh, the second one was by Professor Temple Grandin. Uh, if you have listened to Professor Temple Grandin before, you will know that this is a woman of substance. Then uh, the third one was by Professor Ruth uh, Newberry from uh, Norwegian University of Life Science. Uh, all this study, we are in 2021. Then in 2022, we have another theory. Uh, the first one in 2022 was delivered by Professor Tina Widowski of University of Guelph in Canada. Uh, the second one was delivered by Dr. Uh, Lisa Young of University of Nottingham. And Lisa talked a lot about elephant. I so much enjoyed her presentation that day. And the last one for the year was delivered by uh, Professor Bas Rodenberg of Utrecht University in Netherlands and Virginia University in Netherlands. So for the panel discussion, uh, we invited uh, uh, four people to talk about panel discussion. Dr. Hala Magellot was there, Ms. Erika Vogue, and Dr. Chris Deskovich was there. Uh, Gulich was not present because I think he was sick that time, and we enjoyed it, and it was a robust discussion. So for our membership, presently, Animal Welfare Group Nigeria, every member is a Nigerian. And we have 75 Nigerians who are members. And these 75 Nigerians are from 22 affiliations. We have people from universities, so many universities in Nigeria, uh, FUNAB, Obafemi Awolowo University, University of Nigeria, Olabiso Nabanjo University, and so many other universities. We have members from research institutes. We have members from journal offices, from government ministries, from industries, we have members from association and human support initiative. And what I wanted to take note is that we started this in FUNAL. 
that's the only one institution and we are spread to another 21 institution and i know that uh, uh, we are going to spread across the group globe i'm sure of that and uh, if you have not joined us uh dr yase will share the membership form at the end of the day you can just join uh, you are free to present uh, your work that are related to animal welfare, animal behavior, one health, open science, and many science. And so thank you so much for celebrating our third anniversary with us. And uh, we, we are open to collaborations, we are open to networking, and we are also open to advice. So thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much <laughs> for giving us a brief um, history about Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. And where we are at the moment, I want to appreciate everybody for, uh, for the encouragement, for the support, and for being part of us. And I know there are a lot of people here. Uh, I will just take one or two of those that have presented on our group just in one minute that may want to say something because some of them I invite, I invited all the presenters, the 33 presenters, and some of them are here today. So uh, they may want to just share one or two things with us in one minute. And, um, and then we move to the next uh, event. I, I don't know if you want to say something, if you are one of the presenters, uh, whether 2021 or 2022, and you like to say something or share your experience about what how it was or what the feedback you got uh, during the meeting, please uh, feel free to indicate by the raise of hand and then I will unmute you. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, Ashio. Uh, I must say I'm the most happiest researcher here today because meeting uh, how do I say the coordinator of this group and being a member of this group has really contributed a lot to my life, my research idea, and so many things. When I first heard about behavior, I was like, behavior, can fish behave? Can I observe behavior? But with the mentoring, tutelage, guidance, and I don't know, give it to Dr. Mrs. Yasiri. She's so good at that. I was so happy at the end of the day of who I am today. I can... I can boldly tell anybody that fish behavior and welfare is something interesting that everyone will really love to go into. So I must really commend the effort of everybody in this group for their effort. I hope my time is not gone, but I have so many things to say. I wish I can just keep on talking and talking that, oh no, nice we one. We still have time at the end. You, you can resolve the remarks. All right, the all right. All right. right. So, Victor, please, one minute. Victor, please, yeah. Uh, Good day, everybody. I'm happy anniversary to Animal Welfare Group Nigeria, and I must sincerely appreciate the coordinator, Dr. Mrs. Oluwa Shemuyashere, Dr. Samuel Andre Shara for the opportunity. Um, this um, group has given me an opportunity to meet with other international students, to also meet with other researchers all around the globe. Um, it has given me an opportunity to um, um, be eloquent. Sometimes I think I might be kind of shy, but I've, it has given me an opportunity to speak out about my research, let people know about what I'm actually doing, and then some other skills this um, um, group has given me. Um, I've been able to learn some other um, soft skills along being a member of Animal Welfare Group Nigeria, and I see it as a very good opportunity that is so much helping me at this moment. Happy anniversary once again to Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, with that, we need to move on. We still have time for comments at the end of the meeting. We need to move on to the next presentation. And this uh, presenter is um, uh, Professor Edmond Sangayado. Sangayado from uh, Nottingham University. And uh, the reason why I invited him to give his talk on this is that I realized that we researchers, we we tend to find it difficult to network with ourselves. You know, we, we, we tend to find it difficult to want to interact with people, learn about what they are doing. So, and it's one of the challenges that is, you know, bringing us back, not making us to be able be the right person, not making us able to be able to talk about our research. So I feel that celebrating this um, 
third anniversary with somebody presenting on this issue at least would help us to be able to tackle that problem. So I want to invite uh, Professor Edmond and he will put us through on how to network as a researcher. Please unmute, sir. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I would like to say congratulations to the Animal of the Group Nigeria. And uh, it's such an honor uh, to talk to a highly illustrious group of individuals who are passionate about uh, what they are doing. So today I'll be talking about uh, networking in science. So I'm going to share uh, just a slide on, on that. I hope everyone can see the slides. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, like, uh, uh, I'm Edmund Sanganyado, and I'm at Northumbria University, and I also work with the Global Young Academy and also Zimbabwe Young Academy of Sciences. So, I also work with the Organization of African Academic Doctors, uh, which are trying to connect all the young uh, African researchers. Uh, in Africa or abroad and try to come up with solutions that can, can address uh, patent questions that are important to Africa. So today uh, I was invited uh, by Dr. Yesere to talk about networking. It's something that is that I'm really passionate about, trying to connect with people from different backgrounds and from people from different uh, communities that I have never had the privilege of being part of. So I view networking as an opportunity. Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe. Uh, so with networking, I view it as an opportunity for me to see uh, life as a Nigerian. How can I tackle our environmental problems as a Nigerian? But I'm not a Nigerian, I'm, I'm from Zimbabwe. But because of my network that I've managed to build, I begin to see uh, these kind of problems around me as someone who is coming from Nigeria, right? But the, that's not only the only benefit that I've found in networking. One other important aspect that I've found is, let's take for example today, right? I came to know about this event through Dr. Yasser and um, it's, I was, how did I come up about to know Dr. Yasser? It was because of her book, uh, Go to the Hand. Right. Uh, I saw she posted on LinkedIn and I, I found it like the cover was really excellent. And I was like, OK, I have to read this book. So reading the book has been something of an eye opener to me. Now I'm coming from a background of environmental chemistry. Now I now try to see the importance of uh, social networking as animals view the social networking. So I can now start to exist as someone who have studied uh, animal welfare, but I haven't studied animal welfare. So this is one, one of the reasons that I have found uh, networking to be really important. I found networking, it helps me to experience uh, uh, areas that I, I, I currently don't have an opportunity of uh, experiencing. And one uh, important thing that I've noticed when I was looking at, uh, at, at networking is what's called social capital theory. What it basically says is uh, there is a Zimbabwean proverb uh, which says uh, <clears throat> a single finger cannot kill uh, a, a, a tick, right? That you cannot kill a tick using a single finger, which is a kind of common knowledge that you need both fingers to squash a tick. So that is the same concept of social capital theory that alone you can't do much, but with others you can do a lot. Now, <clears throat> what is really networking? Uh, networking is all about building, uh, extending your community from where you are right now. It might be a, a, a specific discipline of research, animal welfare environmental chemistry, but you are trying to expand your network, your, your, your reach or your identity to include other areas. So 
that's why it's really important uh, to network, especially if you're an early career researcher. But one uh, uh, the important thing that we need to be aware of, uh, we need to understand that as scientists, we are now existing in what is now termed the attention economy. And right? what it simply means is uh, whatever you are doing as a scientist, it's not really going to speak of itself, but it now needs a mouthpiece. It now needs someone who is going to talk about what you are doing for everyone else to hear about it. So it becomes a challenge, especially for us scientists or behavioral scientists or, or an ecologist, because we believe in, or in, in objective knowledge, but uh, what data that we have found, what does it mean? Then we communicate those hard findings. But now with the attention economy, we now need to have to give our uh, objective data a voice so that it can communicate to a wider audience. And that's when networking comes in. It helps us to connect with an audience that we may never had the opportunity of reaching it's because you have now established some kind of uh, uh, a pipeline that you can now use to reach other areas of interest i'll just give an example of what is happening today uh, i never had dreamt of um, at the beginning of this year that i'm going to give a presentation to uh, researchers who are interested in animal welfare Right. I never had that plan in at the beginning of the year, but because of the network that I managed to build throughout the year, that opportunity availed itself. And I give thanks again to Dr. ESL for inviting me. And how is that? Did that happen? Like I said, Dr. ESL posted something on, on, on LinkedIn and I commented on that. So it's that platform LinkedIn acted as a, a vehicle for me to 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 to, to gain some attention to give some attention to a specific event that was taking place in a country which is miles away from where I am at. So it's really important to ask ourselves how am I going to conduct my science in this attention economy? Uh, with attention economy, I want to highlight something else again that what when people give attention to you is because of some kind of social capital that you have right sometimes it's because of the university that you're associated with right or it's sometimes because of one publication that you made right or it's a, it might be because of uh someone you know right i'll give an example uh when i moved to china right it was easier for me to network because I'll just mention the name of my PhD supervisor. You are someone famous in China. So everyone wanted to be part of my team because of that kind of social capital. Then if someone from Harvard University to Oxford University, Cambridge walks in, people will want to associate with that particular person. So that is what is happening now with attention economy that sometimes the things that are valued so that you can be given a voice or so that you can form a partnership do not necessarily mean that you're a good scientist. So now the question that I'm trying to answer in this presentation is, how can I network when I don't have the social capital that people throng to, towards uh, in this kind of current attention economy? So the first thing that you need to do is you need to know your strength. Right, you need to know what's your strength really, especially when it comes to uh, communication. Uh, when I look at, my, at myself, my example is uh, I'm what is considered an introvert. Uh, that is introvert when it is face-to-face -face interaction, but behind the screen, I become an extrovert. I don't know how that happened, but that's what I discovered about myself. So attending conferences to network, doesn't work for me because of my personality. So you need to know what's your strength. Are you someone who is extroverted that when you go for a conference, you're quick to talk to people, quick to build networks. So you need to know your strength. That's some kind of the first thing before you jump into form network, you need to know your strength, not only your strength in terms of your personality, but also in terms of your science, right? What is the 
kind of contribution that you can give to any discussion that you have. So you need to be able to know this is my scientific strength and this is my personal strength. And you need to leverage your strength, especially when it comes to networking. Like what they say, you need to put your best foot forward. So you need to always remember that. Now, another important thing is find your voice. Uh, with finding your voice, it's, you need to understand what is it that you're really passionate about and how can you communicate that passion, right? Uh, I was reading Dr. Yesere, um, its book, uh, and I liked one thing that she mentioned that she always said she talked about animals, right? She was always talking about animals. That's her voice. So when it comes to talking about other things, maybe about social network, about network, I'm sure she was going to give examples that come from the animal kingdom. So it's really important for us, right? If you want to network, you need to know your voice. Uh, as for me, one thing that I found that I'm really passionate about, uh, it's not really about my passion, but because of my background, where I come from, right? I found myself that I'm drawn to discussions on injustice. So when there is uh, any form of injustice, I'm always kind of commenting about that. For example, injustice in science publishing, that's kind of my air, my niche that I'm always commenting on. I, I write about that, I talk about that. That's my voice, that's where I like, um, there is uh, in, in, in my language in, in Shona, there's been an expression that says, uh, which means in that area, you when your name is called, you hear, you are quick to, if this is your song and people just say Edmund, Edmund doesn't wait to be invited to the dance floor, you jump straight away to the dance floor. So that is kind of what, what's really important. After you know your, your, your strength, know your voice so that you can dance to the right tune when it comes to networking. And then the other thing that you need to do is you need to find your place. Uh, I'm not saying know your place, which is trying to reduce you to something that you are not, but to find your place. Uh, <clears throat> for some of us, uh, you, you'll find that the best place that you can communicate or reach out to people of different uh, backgrounds is through WhatsApp. Right, it might be the easiest platform that you can use to connect to people. So you leverage that and come up with a strategy of how am I going to build my network through WhatsApp? Am I going to join some WhatsApp groups? And how can I go benefit from those WhatsApp groups without creating unnecessary noise? Right. So you need to have kind of a, a strategy of identifying the right place for you. Uh, for me, the best place that I found that I was going to, what that was really useful in building my network was it was um, LinkedIn and ResearchGate. Uh, the reason why I I I I, I picked ResearchGate was I found it it was easier that I post my work and read other people's work and write comments on their work, then try to have conversations about the work that they are doing. So it became easier to build my network through that. And I can, I, I, I can mention that one of the connections that I made through LinkedIn, which was around 2018, today we have published, I think, around five different articles and edited together as two special issues. And that connection, that network, it was started through ResearchGate. Then uh, another resource that I use is AuthorAid. With AuthorAid, you just sign up, then I, I've formed some uh, good networks. Someone requested that they need to be mentored and I helped them in preparing their manuscripts. And uh, three years later, I actually visited that blessed person at their home and they bought Christmas gifts for my kids. And I went to their university and gave presentation. And it all started from author aid. That, that was how we built that uh, relationship. So you can see that when you know your place, it's easier uh, for you to build uh, a network that is kind of sustainable over time. Then another issue that is really important is you need to join our community. Uh, I understand animal welfare com group is an example of a community, right? Of people who are interested in animal welfare, right? So you need to find those 
different communities that that uh, speaks to you i can so i can say um one one example for in my case i, I found that uh, it was easier for me to be a member of a society of environmental toxicology and chemistry africa not the worldwide group i tried to be a member of the worldwide group but it didn't work with me right so i opted to just stick to the uh CTEC africa because it was easier for me to make contributions that are kind of recognized by my community right it was easier for me to propose uh, uh talks in that in that context it was easier for me to talk to people from different countries making friends from benin making friends from south africa from kenya it was easier for me to be a member of that community but what is important is to join a community and become a member of that community by participating in the events that community organizes so it became easier for me to network uh, within that particular community uh, then another important issue that we, we, uh, I have found is really important is to start a course. Uh, as scientists, there are so many things that we can, uh, we need to talk about, right? Uh, so I'll give an example of uh, what uh, I did uh, with my group uh, when we were working together with Zimbabwe Young Academy of Sciences. So as COVID was ravaging the world, I noticed, uh, I noticed about uh, the problem of misinformation. If you notice, I think everyone saw that so I was kind of worried uh, that this is going to affect my country a, a lot. So what I thought was with, together with some friends of mine, say, okay, what if we start a conversation between scientists and journalists? Not only a conversation, but a conversation that trains future journalists on science journalism. So we did that uh, with my friends. So we connected with some journalists who helped uh, mentor some some young science journalists and through that uh, course that i noticed i ended up building my network not only to include uh research, researchers only but also journalists and in an actually upcoming journalist so building that network to work with journalists it became easier for journalists to interview me for different events Right. So one time I was inv in in invited to talk at uh, DW News Africa. Another time I was invited to talk at Radio Africa, Radio France International. So all those, it was because of the relationship or the network that I built with journalists. So extending our network should not be only to uh, scientists only, but to broaden it, to include all different stakeholders uh, that uh, that have got uh, goals that are similar to ours. That is going to help in actually building our careers, but also uh, building our networks, so to say. Uh, what if networking fails? Uh, any, any good thing, anything worth trying, sometimes it fails, right? Uh, sometimes it's so easy to blame yourself when things that don't work. I remember when I was a PhD student and uh, the number one uh, uh, <clears throat> tip that we were given, given when it comes to networking was to attend conferences. So I attended conferences religiously. I went starting from 20, 2011, 2012, every year I'll go once or twice or sometimes three times to different conferences in different cities. Right. And I used to print my business cards, try to hand out business cards. Sometimes I printed my research papers, try to hand out research papers. And out of all that effort, I never had a single uh, uh, relationship with someone else. I never built my network through conferences. So I told myself <laughs> this network thing is, is not for me. But it only took some time later that I realized that no, networking through conferences wasn't really for me right because i had everything against me remember what i talked about social capital that i was coming from not so significant uh university i had not published in any top journal and my supervisor then in, in, in the u.s was not that very famous in u.s so everything was kind of working against me so people didn't at my poster right when i'm standing on my poster People were really, there was nothing that I could give to people who wanted to be part of my network, so to say. 
So I changed. That's the reason why I looked back and okay, notice okay, these are the barriers that I have when it comes to conferences. They don't work for me. So what can work for me? So that's when I started to like focus on research, get LinkedIn, Twitter, find my voice, write blog articles, write articles for science, right? And with all those things, I started building my network now. So that is one thing that you need to just to remember that when an approach fails, right? So remember that there are some barriers inherent in networking, but find the approach that works best for you. So how do you do that? You need, you, you need to add a strategy to your plans. So as the year is coming to an end, and uh, 2023 is dawning, uh, we need to have to arrange or create a scheme for using how you're going to use your cause, your community, your place, your voice to build your network, right? You need to have a clear strategy, maybe a marked calendar that you, that you have. And you know, you have to design some ideas that are going to help you to navigate those plans that you have. So it's really important that we have a clear strategy. Okay, in 2023, I want to build a network for young environmental chemists across Africa. And the goal of that is so that we can write a, a, a policy paper together that can be, that we're going to hand into Africa Union as part of the 20, vision 2020, 2030. So that's your, your kind of your plan strategy for 2023. So you work towards it, you play put in place, find the right people, try to build your network with that. So when, 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 you, when, when, you, when you are faced with failure, it's important to have a strategy and a plan so that even if you feel you know that, okay, I did what I did, it didn't work and, and I can improve here or I can move on to something else. So it's really important that we have, we add a strategy to all our plans, especially when it comes to networking. So what, as you are building your network, you need to continue asking yourself, why am I networking, right? Because uh, a network can be viewed as a, an entanglement, right? You're entangled with individuals from different uh, areas, different countries, different disciplines. Uh, you need to ask yourself, is this entanglement strengthening me, building me up as a researcher, or it's restricting my motion, right? Is it pulling me back or is it it's pulling me upwards, pushing me upwards? So you need to keep on auditing yourself that it's not all, all, not all networking is going to build you as a researcher. So you need to know which kind of networks you need that aligns with your research goals, that aligns with your career goals. So it's really important to have that in mind. And with that, I'll say uh, thank you for having me and congratulations once again to the Anma Welfare Group in Nigeria. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your time in preparing this talk, despite the short, uh, you know, the short time when I um, invited you. If you could do this, I really, really appreciate it. And I, I already got uh, a lot of tips on how to network as as a person, as a researcher, uh, knowing your strengths, of course, finding your voice and the right place. So know what works best for you and then join a community and be active in that community and start a course, you know, talk about something and, you know, interact with other people who are also in that area. I really appreciate it. I have a, a uh, there is a question for you here in the chat box. Looks like something you've talked about, but let me just take it. How do you convince other scientists across the globe to network with you. Maybe, for instance, uh, scientists in the developed countries don't believe in those from developing countries. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. I didn't know how to <laughs> address it within the context of the presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about my experience first. Okay. So when I was, uh, after I finished my PhD, I went back to Zimbabwe. I was working at a small university in Zimbabwe. So I really wanted to build my network and began sending emails uh, across the world. And uh, to no one's surprise, most of my emails were never responded to. Whenever I sent emails using my email from Zimbabwe, there were no response. So I tried a different tactic where you add a read receipt 
right? To make sure that each email that you read, when that individual read that email, you receive a notification. Yes, my emails didn't go to junk folder. They were actually read, but never responded to. Then I moved to China and I continued with uh, my pathway of using emails. My emails always went blank. Then that's when I started a different strategy. I told myself, okay, I'll forget about researchers in the developed world. I'll forget about the famous researcher. I'm going to talk, look, look for collaborations with people like me. So when you look at my publication record, you'll notice I've written with young people from Ghana, many from Nigeria, many young people from South Africa, many young people from Zimbabwe. And if you look at all of us, we are, are all just young Africans trying to publish. And I tried to connect with young people from South America. We, we published with young people from South America. So that's when I realized that my strategy of trying to reach up there wasn't working. And up there, there was nothing for me. But where I was standing, that's where my network was. So at the end of the day, with those seemingly unpopular people from Africa, all right, from Nigeria, from Zimbabwe. Uh, my article with, uh, with a guy from Zimbabwe is one of the most cited papers in, in, in the sense of the total environment. 300 citations in less than three years. My article with, the, with my friends from Nigeria, Kenya, and this, we published it this year. It is, I think, around 20 citations. We published it this year, right? So what did I learn from that? I learned that I don't have to look up there for people who can enrich my career. They are right here with me. It's just a matter of opening the door and talking to them. Wow, wow, <laughs> that is amazing. So you have everybody, you have the people just with you there and just to make use of that opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't really have any more question here, but uh, a comment from Said says a very insightful presentation many times, thanks. And um, Elito says precise and wonderful presentation. So thank you so much. I hope you still stay with us. <laughs> yeah, <that was laughs> because, yeah, thank you so much. So we would like to continue the program. Yeah, it's good to hear the story of people. And uh, I would like uh, Dr. Sunday Abonika to share, share with us his passion, the story behind what he does. And we'd like to hear from you, sir. Dr. Sunday, okay. Please unmute, yeah. Yeah. Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, please. Okay, so good good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, um, depending on where you're joining from. Um, let me just jump straight into the matter. And I think my story is one that I would love to say, animal behavior found me. I, I didn't find animal behavior, if I'll put it that way. I'll go back, first of all, to talking about the fact that while growing up as children, my father just, I don't know why, but then because it wasn't so popular a thing in our place also at the time, but my father made sure that we always had at least one dog in our home while we were growing up in our family. And beyond that fact that we just always had dogs in the house, there was one particular dog that changed our lives forever. And one particular dog that our childhood memories is completely incomplete. Pardon my, my English if um, we do not remember him. And that dog's name was Skipper. Skipper was a dog that was given to us as a puppy. Um, the first veterinarian from my tribe, Amigala by tribe, and the first veterinarian from my tribe, um, Dr. Stephen Achama, was a friend of my father. He traveled to the UK once and then came back to Nigeria with some trained German Shepherd puppies. And he gave my father one of those German Shepherd puppies as a gift. That was the dog we named Skipper. Skipper was literally a part of our childhood, a part of the family in every way you can think about. Um, so as children, then Skipper would play with us. He would play football with us. He would play 
hide and seek every other thing. We, we, we play a good number of games and all of that then as children with skipper. And there are too many stories to tell when it comes to skipper, but maybe I'll just try to just mention two or three quickly to say some of the things that really endeared us to skipper and some of the reasons why skipper is skipper memories who continue to live with us. Um, so I remember then that um, we had a famous, there was a famous um, mad person in my town then, someone who would usually go around um, the city and whenever he comes to you in my local dialect, what he will tell you for anyone who comes to you, he will tell you, Doko Jewa, which means bring the money for your head. And if you do not give him money, he will stone you. So everyone was so scared of this guy, and people would run away when they see him. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, Skipper just happened to come one certain afternoon when my mother's friend came to visit, and then she wanted to take my mom out. They had just come out. My mother's friend was trying to open the door to the car so that they would both get him, and that was when teacher of who this famous smart person came and then told the both of them, Doko Jewa. Now, Skipper at the time was a dog that when he grew up, Skipper would, he was so intelligent, he does not eat from anywhere else except his favorite place. If you put even his favorite food anywhere except that place, Skipper would put it. Um, Skipper also then, we used to have him tested outside with the chain. At the time, there was no chain that we had that we would skip up. He does not poo in the house. He does, he doesn't, he does not drop feces in the house as well. Um, anytime he wants to go, that's anytime he wants to drop feces, he would tear whatever chain we had that if there was a chain, tear the chain, scale the gates, no matter how high that gate is, scale the gate, go outside, do his thing, then come back in the house. So the house is almost always clean. He does not eat from anywhere else. As if he was so intelligent, a dog. He never, Skipper will never bite anyone. But if Skipper really means anyone, he will use his claws, fingers on that person. Now, let me come back to this story that I'm saying. So now, this page will be Skipper was actually tethered um, with the chain outside on the front of the house. And then he saw this madman talking to my mother and my mother's friend. And the moment Skipper saw that, Skipper just, he was on chain, like I said, but he cut, destroyed the chain as usual. And then Skipper flew over the gate, scaled over the gate. And the moment this madman saw Skipper, that was when I knew that even in his madness, he was still sane enough to be able to think, in the sense that our house is on a slope. So in the split second that he saw Skipper, flying over the fence to come out at him. In that split second, with his lunatic state, he figured immediately that if he was going to run up the slope, it was going to be an uphill task for him. He very likely may not be able to make it. Skipper will catch up with him. He then thought again, if he runs down the slope, he very likely will tumble. So what he did was turn directly opposite our house and just run straight into the bush. The bush, part, the bush that was there. And then he ran straight through the bush and Skipper chased after him until he fell where there was a fence. And then um, he fell at the fence there and Skipper came there and used his claws, gave him some marks on his leg and then Skipper came back again and came to the house. So Skipper didn't give him a bite. From that day onward, in that particular unit, the mad, mad, mad person saw anybody from my family anywhere no matter how far he was from the house, he would rather avoid us but go meet other people and everything. Um, so that's one story. Uh, at the same, so we also left our, we left the former house where we were, a rented apartment, and then we moved to our own apartment, which was miles away. And then we took Skipper in the car also to this new house, like I said, miles away. And overnight, we discovered that that Skipper had destroyed a chain that we placed him on when we got to the new house. He had killed the fence, he had gone out. For us, that was normal. But then three days later, we didn't see Skipper. We're now only looking what happened. And then the owner of the former house, like I said, miles and miles away, comes to our house and he's asking us, what happened now? What did he do to us that we had that we decided to punish him this way? And we're like, what happened? And he told us, 
that um, he just opened the gates to his compound and just found our dog and our dog chased him back to his car and he ran away and everything. And then that was when we discovered, oh, so Skipper had gone all the way back to that particular house, which, like I said, is very, very far in an entirely different part of town. And so we now took my immediate elder brother at the time, and then my father went with him in the car, we went, picked up Skipper, brought him back to our new house. We now sat down and spoke to Skipper and told him, this is now your house. I think we had a conversation with Skipper that they were bring him back, telling him, this is now your new house, blah, 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 all of that. And that was when, that was, that was how Skipper never returned back to that other house again. One more quick story. Um, and this one, I don't know because at the point it's time, this one, so now that I'm old, it's also so outrageous. But legend has it from my elder ones. <laughs> legend has it that while we were still at the former house then, I was a lot younger at the time, um, that the rental apartment then. We had sheep, we had goats, and all of that. And then we had skipper also. And legend has it, according to my elder ones, that um, a Fulani herdsman was moving past in front of our house one day, his castle and sheep. And our gate for that house was usually not that strong. And then the sheep that we had went, and our sheep went through um, the gates, went to meet up with them, um, went to meet up with his own herd of animals. And our parents, my mom and my dad were outside the front of our house when, or came outside after this happened. And they were having a discussion about how we will be able to now get out our own animals from this particular herd. Like I said, legend has it. <laughs> so legend has it from my elder ones that um, Skipper heard this conversation and went outside the compound. And then the next thing we knew minutes later was Skipper was coming back. Um, at this point, let me say this way. Skipper was coming back all smiles on his face. And he was leading our sheep in the exact number of sheep that we actually had in his front. And he brought them back to the house. And he was smiling and everything. Um, so for me, this was uh, my, our experience with Skipper, especially beyond the other dogs, was just a determining factor for my relationship with animals and everything. And so when I got to the university to study veterinary medicine, I think I was part of the 90% of those that were, at the time, veterinary medicine was not so popular. I, in fact, when I saw veterinary medicine on my um, admission letter, I did not even know what that meant. And so my parents badly wanted me to change and wanted, like the regular African parents would want um, the child or Nigerian parents at the time, would want most of the children to study medicine or want children to study medicine. That was what I applied for. And my parents kept on with really advising, telling all of that for me to get to move to medicine or change to another course in sciences. In some other level, I have filled a change of course form. The new department um, by chemistry was ready to accept me. The HOD had already agreed everything. And all that was remaining was for me to submit my form. That was to the, my department had, okay, well, all that was remaining was my department to sign me out. And then I am sending that department. Staff form was in my hand, I filled. I just didn't submit. And I think I want to trace that back to my whole thing with Skipper and everything. And so all my, that whole thing with Skipper and all made me so intrigued about animal behavior that even while in university, I, just so seriously sought to be able to have, to grow my knowledge of animal behavior. Even when I knew that it wasn't a specialty in Nigeria, there was no place at the time that I could get that knowledge in Nigeria. So reading through textbooks, veterinary textbooks and all then, I kept seeing things like DACBD, Diplomate, American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. And I walked up to one of my lecturers one of those days and asked him, he was somebody who was quite um, traveled, who had traveled to different parts of the world. And asked him, um, sir, can you please explain to me what is the difference between a diplomat in um, animal behavior and a master's in animal behavior? And he gave me that whole, um, he gave me the whole explanation of it then. Fast forward to 2019 when I was accepted into the Mandela Washington Fellowship and I was going to the US. And I made sure that while doing the whole process that I got in touch with people who had that particular um, certification in the US. And I asked a number of them if I could meet up with them in the US and understand what it means to be a diplomat in animal behavior. And the head of department at the time of, um, animal, of the animal behavior unit in the University of Pennsylvania was gracious enough to have answered my mails, given me a full appointment. 
And when I was in, when I was in the US, he, he, I got, he gave me the opportunity to come and shadow him for a day, which I did. And I saw what it meant to be an animal behaviorist and stuff. So I'll kind of say this is a quick summary of, of like my own story so far and everything that has got me so hooked on animal behavior. And I would, for me, I would very much chase it all the way back to Skipper. Yeah. Thanks to Skipper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, it's really, really interesting to see how uh, the family dog has, you know, got really into you guys and made you realize the importance of uh, the care for animals and especially dog when it comes to your case. Yeah. Ogochuku would like to hear from you. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Sunday. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. My name is Ogachuku Uzoma. And I feel a little bit out of my depth right here, right now, because I am not a researcher. I am not a scientist. I am not a vet. I am not an academic in any way, shape, or form. I'm actually a script writer and editor with um, uh, Multi Choice West Africa. But I just on LinkedIn, I just got drawn to like somebody just told me to this thing that you're interested in. Maybe you'll find a group here that might be really into this thing. So I just, I think I bumped into a post by Dr. Iyasiri. I hope I pronounced your name right. <laughs> anyway, I bumped into a post and I, it was like, she just spoke my soul in that post. I was like, I, I liked her post. I commented and she, and we started talking from that moment. So the whole animal welfare thing, I won't say it's a particular story. Like I said, there's no particular story. It's just, will I say, I don't know if it sounds corny, but I've always been very empathetic towards animals, all animals, animals with flesh and blood mostly, <laughs> and fur, not insects, animal with flesh and blood and fur and skin and bones. I've always had this, um, I don't know, since I was, since I can remember my earliest, earliest memories, I, I was known to be like animal mom. I grew up in Keja Fan. My father was a, was a electrical engineer at Fan, Fan Quarters, Ikeja. So there were lots of people that had pets, had dogs that were roaming around. One or two, our neighbor had a cat. We didn't grow up with pets, but I would spend hours and hours with the neighbor's puppies. When, I, when anybody hears that, oh, there's this person that has had puppies, I'm the first person that will be told, and I'm there, and I'm going to be there, like, for one holiday from school. I'll be there all day, carrying puppies, petting them, inhaling their cute puppy breath, and if it's a cat, rabbits, my neighbor had rabbits, my neighbor went on vacation once, and he came to my house and told my dad that he knows that I like his rabbits, that I should take care of his rabbits till they come back home, because eating his rabbits are flat. <laughs> And fruits and everything that we had in the house. So I've always had this um oh, different towards them. The other thing that happened in the village, in my village, when I was like four or five years, I remember that one very clearly. And I don't know, distant cousins, Christmas, do you know how Ibo people travel for Christmas? One of my neighbors, one of my cousins was like, I saw him tie, there was this goat I'd been playing with, this little goat. And then one morning I came out and I saw him tied arms and hands and legs together. And he was like, I was like, why are you taking it to? He said, they are going to kill it for. I said, eh, I started screaming. I cried and cried and cried. I was following him around the compound in the village. My, the children in the village were just laughing. It was so strange to them. Like, what's wrong with her? Why is she crying? Cried and cried and cried. I was begging him to leave the good. Until somebody finally distracted me. And I probably had a share in the good meat at some point of the day. I don't know, but I got distracted and that was it. So I always had this um, love for, for animals. We finally got our first, um, our own family dog when I was probably my late teens. And of course the dog became part of our family in every way, shape or form. The person that even brought the dog was not even as attached to the dog as I was. We didn't have dogs all my life because my mom is, was terrified of dogs. But because of me, I've preached to her, she's now like the dog mom in the house. She's like, we have a dog that in my family house. I'm married now in my own house. My family, our dog is 12 years old now. He's blind, he's, but he's happy. He just eats, sleeps, wake up, gets his pets and petting and goes back to sleep, but he's there. 
I'm waiting for. I'm mostly, I don't really care about, um, about breeds. And I use my, my, my WhatsApp status to keep telling. When I bring it up, people look at me weird, like, what's this one talking about? But I don't care. Because there's this, there's this um, Nigerian, um, I don't know, if it's not fluffy and soft, they give it this, this bingo. Is it like it's, it, it, it kills my soul because this, I am so, um, I have a special love for mongrels. If it's not a mongrel, I don't want it. I know I love all dogs, but those dogs, they are privileged. Let me put it that way. The German Shepherds, the uh, Lassas, the, uh, what do you call those expensive dogs that you spend hundreds of, people want them. But these mongrels on the streets, nobody cares about. So I do, as, I try as much as possible to preach about, see, oh, what you people call local dog is local. Uh, what you people call your foreign dog is a local dog. Oh, it's your Alaskan, Alaskan husky that you brought all the way from Alaska. That is not even supposed to be in a, in a, in such a region, like in a hot country. It comes here, it doesn't even live long, it dies because it's meant to be in, Temperate region. It's an Alaskan or Tibetan husky or whatever. But because of you know the status of oh my dog is big and stuff, we have our local dogs, our so-called local dogs. These dogs that you worship here are local, where they come from. Can we focus on uh God put these dogs here because of our, our climate? It's, they 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 survive in our climate. They are strong, they are hardy, they are so intelligent. These mongrels are the most one of like really intelligent, strong dogs. And there is no difference between them and these so-called um, expensive dogs. So that's one thing that I know I have tried to do by myself with my my um, friends. Whenever I, I make posts like that, they, some of them come to my DM and I educate them. Like, you guys try to help these ones. So a lot of people have, they're all over the streets, they're everywhere. And I try to help, I try to feed them. They are afraid, they are, they, they, they are used to being kicked and but they are dogs too. And I wish there was something I could do. That I really wish there was something I could do about these dogs, really wish. Cause that's like my main passion is just to be, to, to have these, these so-called local dogs be cared for and loved and not put in chains. Even, even the expensive ones, people, I don't believe in breeding. I don't, I don't, I never do breed um, dog breeds cause they don't, um, they don't ethically breed them. Most, most them breeders in Nigeria are just, horrible. So I'm trying as much as possible to educate people about this brilliant thing, keeping dogs in chains from morning to night. Dogs are made to run, they're supposed to exercise. And all of, all of those things, they really hurt my soul. So I don't have a dog currently because I don't, my landlord is terrified of dogs. So I had one that for, that he, he died after one, just one year. It was very sad. I got him in middle of COVID, my birthday, 2020. I got him and after one year, he said, just one year old, and instead of having a um, bladder blockage, we had the vet remove stones, and then it finally blocked, and we had tried to do surgery, but it was too late. So we just had to put him down. It was just one year old. So since then, I've been it, I've been traumatized <laughs> about getting another dog. I, it, it, I, I think about it, and I just keep thinking, oh, what should I have done? What would I have done? I keep, now his name is Buddy. But Adre, Adrenaline, my family dog is still alive and well in my father's, in my parents' house, 12 years old, and he'll be 13 this year. And I'm, he makes me happy whenever I see him. <laughs> he can't see, but he can smell and, and hear everybody. He knows, he knows everybody. So really, my story is endless when it comes to <laughs> animals. And not just dogs, I love cats. I love rats. I know some people will say it's weird. I would rather chase the rat out of my house. And I even tell them, please don't come back. I know they will come, but because they don't have sense. But I, I can't, I, I literally cannot kill a rat. I don't know how to do it. Because to me, it's like a small dog. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. I wish they could listen and just stay outside, but they won't because that's their nature. And then this whole while, when I was listening to the lecture about the pangolins, it, it really broke my heart because this bushmeat of a thing is, is a problem in this country. And I have tried to, Nobody listens. I don't know what to do about it. I can't force people. I don't know if it's hunger of third world country. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, I do my best. I do not consume any bush meat or anything that is endangered. It makes people look at me like, I beg go. You know, they have this look like you're crazy, but I'm used to it. I've always been a little bit not as, as normal as other people. So I'm used to it. So I try to, uh, I'm glad I found this group and I hope 
I don't know how I can do anything because I, like I said, I can only talk, but I hope there's a way I can help with this animal welfare thing. So that's it. So it's so good to be here and meet everybody. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You me. You can help. You don't. You may not be a researcher. You may not yeah. be academic. So you can help by writing. You write good. So yeah. write and keep writing and keep posting, and people will see and read. So that is an aspect that you can, you know, you, you can take up and help to fight. Thank you. Because thank you. It may take time, but at least just start doing it gradually. And yeah, I love that. <laughs> thank you. I will. I will. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Oguchiku. Yeah, uh, your story is so <laughs> it's so serious. I really enjoyed it. But I've never lived with pets. You know the nature of you know the Nigerian situation now. The parents don't can consider these things important. I've never lived with pets, but I've lived with some backyard farm animals, and I think that is where I also got the inspiration working with animals. And I love something that you actually said that yes, we have our local dogs. Why do we keep on a, a importing or getting the foreign dogs? Yeah, and I think maybe that is also the reason why I'm stuck to the Nigerian indigenous chickens because if you compare it to the they will say, what is this? This one that doesn't have meat. But they are still chickens. Somebody needs to talk about them. And I like it that you are talking about the, the local dogs in Nigeria. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we need to move on. Mona, Mona would like to give her feedback on, um, <laughs> on our experience because she was one of those that presented in 2021. Hello, Mona. Hello. Yeah, first of all, um, yeah, congratulations to the third uh, anniversary of this uh, group. And um, yeah, I just can say, just keep up the great work because I think you are the only group worldwide. Um, and we saw this in the first presentation. Uh, yeah, who managed to get all these um, speakers from, from all over the world um, in just one uh, yeah, seminar um, series. So that's great. And also your um, uh, social media um, activities, that's, that's really, really uh, great and helpful. Building networks can only agree with everything that uh, Edmund said previously. Um, so yes, that's uh, quite nice. And also, um, um, also how you um, involve uh, young researchers, young research talents, we say uh, giving them a platform um, to talk about the research and then, um, yeah. So, yeah, well done. Thank Great. you so much. Um, really yeah. that. Thank you. And uh, for me, I, I also never grew up with uh, pets or with, uh, with, with uh, farm animals or whatsoever. Um, so, and I think because, because my, my mom was uh, very afraid of any animals and I think that was <laughs> driver for me to to um, finally study veterinary medicine yeah thank you so much thank you for your group because it, when we looked at the breakdown of presentations that we had from the Netherlands they are mainly from your group and sincere yes. appreciation to you to Baz and to Rebecca thank you for your support we really appreciate you thank you so we need to move on <clears throat> Next, uh, we're supposed to have a presentation from Tumishi, but he's not available. And we go on to Safian Abdurrahman. He would like to talk to us about uh, the situation, what the situation is like in Ghana. Mm -hmm. uh, Safian has been uh, consistent. He has been joining us right from the time we started. And uh, because in Ghana, they are yet to get you know, a group together, but he joins us most of the time for our webinar. So I want to give him that opportunity to say something about uh, Ghana. Well, um, for us here is um, good afternoon yeah. to Doc and then good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much for giving me. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to fellow participants, and then uh, good afternoon to your very good self, Doc. Uh, 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 first of all, I want to thank you. So, in fact, 
even though I started work before we met, but uh, my interaction with you has actually um, helped me a lot in my work and the way I think about what I do and the impact I wish to make uh, in the life of animals and um, society as a whole. And then Animal Warfare Nigeria group is a very fantastic group and I think a very um, intense where when it comes to learning and sharing of ideas. In fact, uh, you've opened the door for Africa to venture into animal welfare to see how best the lives of animals could be enhanced or improved. And so I wish to thank you and then the, the whole group for accepting me in as the only Ghanaian for now. I want to assure you that uh, we're going to have a lot more we yeah, are people joining in and hopefully uh, synchronize hours because we are busy also put, putting together our odds to see how best we can also have something like this, um, hopefully um, next year. All right, what really interests me to go into animal welfare campaign or activism? In fact, I am a born a Greek person. My father and mother are all both um, farmers. My father used to have a lot of animals in the house, both. Um, uh, for a chicken, goats, sheep, cattle, and I used to head the sheep. And so even without even going to school. And so during the process of that, I was, um, I came into contact with one lamb whose mother had just passed on after delivering it. And so I had, I, I took on the, the, the mothership rule to, to nurture it, to, 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 to grow. And in fact, it was very tedious when I started with it because every time it has to be with me whilst I'm taking care of the others. It got so used to me that um, I couldn't go anywhere without it. And even when I went to school, when my father finally sent me to school, anytime I have to go to school, I have to lock it inside the pen. Otherwise, it would follow me to school. And when I come back from school, the first thing I do is to open it, feed it, and also uh, take it out with the others. Uh, it was after, I think, um, a 14 months, because it was more than a year, that uh, one time I went to school, came back in the afternoon, only to find it dead in the pen. I was so shocked, seriously, I was so shocked, and wept almost the whole day. My, 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 my stepmom didn't understand why. I told him that my part of my life is um, gone because it was, I was so close to it. And so it was so close to me that I felt it was the only friend I had. And so when it, when, when it died, I, I didn't believe it. I didn't understand why it had to die. And so when my dad came home, I asked him what, what, what happened. Unfortunately, my dad um, poisoned uh, banana peels. <laughs> rats in his room my mom went to clean the room and then brought those things out and then that was it but it was twice but uh, but then um it had already eaten it and then they passed on and so for two days my, in fact my, my father was like consoling me every day and assuring me that i'll get another but that didn't happen because no not 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 one or one could replace it and so growing up that thing became part of my life i i, I tried to situate that to the life of man how we are able to live with people and this one without um, the mother i was the mother and then it had to go so i tried as much as possible to try and see how best i could help in a way animals so that at least they'll be free they'll be able to live their life freely and normally without any hindrances and so i decided to pursue a greek when i went to high school and so from there in fact, I, my, 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 my passion moved a bit into business. After secondary school, I went into business, but still trying to rear the animals, so taking care of the animals. It was after university, because I went to the University of Ghana, Legon, and read um, public administration. And when I came back, it's like now the real call has come. Why? Why do you want to leave something that you have always want, wanted to do? And so I said to myself that, no, this time around, I want to go fully uh, a livestock farmer, not really farming, 
by wanting to understand what animals want, their life, how they feel living together and living with human beings. How does human beings help them? And so I started reading a bit about it. Whilst I had my two or three ship in the pen, they studying it and then also just trying to see how best we could live um, together. And so in the course of that, a friend of mine who is in the um, UK, in fact, it's an animal welfare um, uh, expert, should I say, Dr. Awal Fusini, he came down from the UK to Tamale. We met and then um, I told him about this thing, but this is my passion for animals. And he said, oh, why? Why don't you do um, animal welfare? This is what is good. And I said, what is animal welfare? And he said, oh, what you are talking about is just animal welfare. So formalize it, do something about it. And I said, okay, fine. So he didn't teach me. He gave me links. He told me, go and read, uh, go to um, HSA's uh, uh, platform, read about it, go to U4, go to Eyes on Animals. So I started reading about it and then trying to synchronize the information together. And then in 2016, I made up my mind that now really what I've gotten is a bit enough for me to start formal work. And so I registered West Africa Center for the Protection of Animal Welfare. In fact, I have a, a very strong um, person in the name of Lukman who helped me a lot in it because anytime I discuss these issues with him, he said, yes, why, this is possible. Why, why not? We can do this thing. He always supported me and up to date, he's always with me. And so we registered and started um, doing our small campaign without funds, we, were, we would sacrifice when we close from school. I'm a teacher, professional teacher actually. But um, anytime we close from school, we'll say, okay, well, there's this community where you have a lot of livestock farmers there. Let's go there and interact with them to see how best we can help them understand the animals, feed them well, give them proper shelter, look for vets. If they need vet services, go in and then uh, expose them to it. That's what we're doing. And then we came across this, um, uh, uh, what's the name, our partners from um, Netherlands that said, okay, well, what we are doing, we're also doing uh, farm animal warfare, so why not? Let us um, work together. So in 2018, they came down and we did our first animal welfare symposium in Ghana. And it was very, very successful. So till then, we have been working with um, livestock farmers, abattoirs. Uh, in fact, and all those who are interested in animal welfare. And I must say that um, LinkedIn, especially Dr. Yasiri, my, my presence on LinkedIn has, has, has been, I don't know how to say it, but, but Doc, please. Doc has influenced me a lot on LinkedIn and especially with the work I do. And so I must commend her so well. She has so much depth in what she's doing. And I sometimes I ask myself whether I'm, I'm passionate about animals because when I see Doc's passion, passion for animals, I ask myself, what are you doing? You need to do more. You need to learn more. And in fact, she made me enroll in the school because I told her that this thing that I'm doing, why, what is happening? And, and then she said, why not? If you think that you can, why not? So I went back to school again to read uh, veterinary um, science, University of um, Development Studies, currently to go into second year actually. And so that's how um, life has been as um, uh, animal welfare, uh, what's the name, campaigner or advocate. And I think that um, a lot has gone through the mill and then we are yet, I think that we are even yet to start because in Ghana here, there's still a lot to do, a lot to do. Most people do not know what animal welfare is. They are not interested in it culturally, religiously. And then, um, I don't know, socially, people think that animals are objects and so they should be treated anyhow. And sometimes the people you think should know best don't know. Because in my interaction with people, I came across somebody who is supposed to know very well, a social, a social um, service worker, who said, my friend, why are you disturbing us like that? You are always on us, animals, animals, animals. Why have we even finished dealing with human beings? Why should I have my animal and you think, and you say, I shouldn't treat it anyhow? And I just give simple answers. When you fall sick, you know that you fall sick and you know where to go. Unfortunately, when this animal falls sick, it cannot even tell you that it's sick. It is some things in it that you are going to look at or observe to see that, no, this animal is sick. And so you need to attend to it. And so I say that 
those things that affects you affect that same animal. So why don't you try as much as possible just to share your life with it? Let it also feel that there is somebody to help it. Otherwise, why? You are using it. You are, you are, you are, you are killing it for food. You are using it for traction. You are using it for all those things, yet you don't want to take care of it. And they say, well, you are, you are disturbing us. And I say, yes, I'm disturbing you, but try as much as possible just to cope with us. And so I think that we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, advocacy, in terms of uh, awareness creation, so that um, people, many people will come to understand that we really share this planet with the animals. Thank you very much, Doc. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll yeah. go on. We still have time for comments, general comments, but uh, because we have uh, outlined uh, some talks and presentation for today, we'll still have time to discuss. And I would like to take this, um, Anis Love. We've heard from Ghana. We want to hear from Kenya. <laughs> yep. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so I'm very, very honored to be here and oh, congratulations. This is such an amazing, amazing group. And I'm so glad to be here and to be able to share from Kenya. My name is Eva. I'm a veterinary surgeon from Kenya. And um, so I'm, um, I'm the founder and managing director of um, Annie's Love. And um, currently now a PhD student. <laughs> so um, where will I start? Oh my, I'm gonna start where the journey began so that Annie's Love can come to be. Annie's Love is an animal behavior and welfare consultancy that is um, based in Kenya. And um, our mission is um, improving the human animal relationship and animal welfare from a point of compassion with our vision being um, creating a network of animal welfare enthusiasts that will create a ripple of um, good animal welfare, um, animal welfare that will improve animal welfare basically and improve the human animal relationship. So um, growing up, I was very, um, I'm a very inquisitive um, person. I like asking questions. Why does it work like that? Why do animals behave like that? And so growing up, I was very, very intrigued with how the animals that we had in our, in, in our, in our home state were the cows, the dogs, why, why, why? So because of this, um, after completing um, my, 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 uh, my form for, we call it the high school education, I said, ah, I actually do um, veterinary medicine. And I remember before that I had other options but I remember one lady um, after my high school, I worked as a preschool teacher. I, I love children. So I remember I, I had to wait for two years to get to campus. And um, the director of the school, she asked me, what do you want to do in campus? And at that time, I think my, I was still growing and my brain was hazy. So I told her, I want something with money. <laughs> it, was, it was funny. We, we always say that. And she told me, no, don't do that follow your heart's desire and the rest will follow. And I'm so glad because that is what I have done and my heart glows so bright. So I'm going to give you a story of that. So I said, ah, I love animals. Animals make my heart glow so bright. So I'm gonna do veterinary medicine. So I enrolled and I did veterinary medicine. Then I remember one time I was talking with my good friend and I told her, if at all I'll ever do a master's, I want to do it in animal welfare. But then I remembered in Kenya, they don't offer that master's directly. So you've seen those things, those dreams that you have, but you know very well that they are really far-fetched. But one thing that I'll tell you today, if you have a dream, if your heart is glowing for something, do not let it burn out. Somehow things just work together for good. And so after I finished my, my campus education, I, I did my internship. Then immediately after my internship, a WhatsApp group that I was on, they posted a scholarship that had been um, advertised for a master's in applied animal behavior and welfare at the University of Edinburgh. And I was like, oh my God, this is so exciting. And the other miracle in it is that 
the post had been extended by 10 days. So I got it when the deadline was going to be tomorrow, but for some reason they had extended it by 10 days. So I said, oh God, I'm going to apply. And one thing, as long as your heart burns, just go ahead because people would ask me, are you sure you're going to get this thing? It's so limited, but I had such faith and I say, this is what my heart beats for. And I'm gonna believe and I'm going to apply for it. And so I applied and I believed and I got the feedback. God is good, I got to go to Edinburgh. I did my master's in applied animal behavior and welfare. And so I was very excited. And on coming back to Kenya, I said, okay, um, um, at times it's, it's not easy getting, especially animal welfare is a very niche um, area. So it's not easy getting a job that is directly linked to that. And my heart burns for animal welfare. And so I said, what I want is to start up something that I can help the, the person in my village, that I can collaborate with anyone from 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 the village from different cultures to because when when we look at the animal welfare space most of the organizations we have are very niche like we find advocacy we find um uh, we deal with horses we deal with small animals but i wanted to be able to do everything and anything because my masters had covered everything so that's how i started annie's love and um, I have amazing partners. Um, two of them, we did masters together at the University of Edinburgh and two of them, they are great pathologists in Kenya. And it, it, it's just been very, very, very beautiful. And one thing that I'm very passionate about is the human animal relationship. And I'm going to give you a little um, thing that happened that touched my heart and that gives me to pass on the message of, of compassion in a very, very specific way. So one time actually, before I did um, my masters, I remember telling, I remember going to the community and just there's one person who told me, send yourself, just go. The little money that I had, I, I took it. I photocopied things with it. I would walk to the villages and ask people questions. And the one question that I had is, what do you feel about animals? Do you keep a dog? And one respondent told me, no. Why? Dogs disgust me. That's what she said. And my heart did not break. I followed her because there has to be a reason why you're disgusted by dogs. And I asked her, why do dogs disgust you? She told me, because they go licking people. I don't like it. Why would a dog lick someone? And I told her, if a dog is calm and it comes, it's licking you, that dog is probably just saying, I love you, hey, I want your attention. And that lady changed. That lady today has three dogs. The other day she called me and I almost cried because I saw her feed her puppies, holding them in her hands. And it is possible, guys, let's not give up. With Annie's love, I am for one human, one animal at a time. For the farmers that you're trying so hard to change and there's, there's, there's resistance, there's a reason. And if we look at it from an emotive point of view, we get it. The other day I was working with a group of poultry farmers who had um, kept animals for 20 years. So with old time farmers, it's very hard to tell them anything. Cause I remember one of them asking me, have you kept chicken for 20 years? <laughs> no, I've not. And I remember just giving them tips on animal welfare. As vets, most of the things that we deal with are animal welfare related. So you go you enter into a farm, the farm has no, for instance, foot bath biosecurity. Those chickens, even if you treat them, they'll keep on getting sick. So treat, um, you get into a farm, the chickens are cannibalizing um, each other. That's because they don't have enrichment. And so I worked with these farmers, baby steps. I'm very, very keen on the compassion bit. And what I would tell you today is be compassionate. There's a reason as to why 
people are the way they are. And we can always change them from a point of compassion. So I worked with these farmers and I remember one of them telling me, oh, Eva, do you know that I normally take a chair and sit down to watch my chicks? And oh, my heart just melted. So baby steps and we will get there. Annie's love is a baby, but I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud of the partners that I have. And the other thing that I would encourage you, at times it takes time for these things to pick. It takes time. And the one thing that you can do for yourself is be patient. There's someone who will want to hear your story. There's someone who will want to work with you. And so one farmer, one person, one animal, the few that I have touched, those ones that I have mentioned, they light up my day. They make my heart burn so bright. And the other thing that I would tell you is like for Annie's love, I have Annie's love, but my heart has always beat so much for me to do a PhD. And that's how I actually got to connect and get to know ESL. So because of one dream, do not let another dream burn out. And I'm so glad Yasere liked one PhD post. I got to know about it from one of my friends and that's how I got to apply for a PhD in the cow calf area. And so we have many dreams and it is us from our homes. I liked how you said um, we connect as Africans to make Africa better. It is us from where we are, we will go get knowledge and bring it back home. Animal welfare in Africa is growing and it is us who will go out there, get knowledge and bring it back home. And we are all amazing. We are all very brilliant. And I'm so glad this is an amazing group. And um, one thing that I will tell you, have compassion. You will touch a million souls. For each animal, each animal is, in, each animal is very, very personal. And just listen to these people. And the one last story, as we encourage people to keep animals, we need to explain to them what it takes to keep an animal. I remember the other day um, I went to the, to, I went somewhere and I was seated and um, the lady who was attending to me told me, hey, I want a dog. And I told her, okay, uh -huh. what kind of dog? The small white fluffy ones, they're really, really beautiful. I told her, uh-huh, okay, uh-huh. Um, she told me I have a small house that I can keep the dog in. I'll be feeding the dog and everything is fine. I told her, ah, okay, fine, we can get a dog. But I asked her, do you know what it takes to keep a dog? And she told me, it's just feeding the dog. What else? I told her, you need money to jab that animal every year. In case that animal gets sick, you need to treat it. And it might cost you a lot of money. That dog needs to take walks. That dog needs your attention. And by the time we were done with me explaining what it takes, she did not want to keep a dog. And I felt happy because that dog would have gone and suffered. And it's not that the humans want to make the animals suffer. It's just that they don't know. And it's us who will be able to tell them that, okay, dogs are nice, but you know what it takes. And baby steps, we will get there. We are doing so well as Africans and we are getting there. I'm so proud of us. It's a field that is growing, that is blossoming and let's hold hands together. Our vision at Annie's Love is hold hands together. Each one of us can touch one, two, three, many souls but from a point of compassion so that we don't scare people away. Our field is a beautiful one. It's a gracious one. And we understand people and we will touch them. Baby steps. Thank you very much. Yeah, baby steps. One step at a time. Thank you, Eva, for sharing your experience on how your passion led you to form Annie's love. And everybody here of course we have love for animals and that is why we are here thank you so much and we'll take the last uh, person then we now open the floor for further discussion uh, with uh, with ourselves so we have in our midst uh, maria my sister who now happens to be the supervisor of ever 
So you see the connection. That is where collaboration comes in. So Eva is here, her supervisor is here, and your supervisor is my sister. <laughs> oh, hello, Maria. <laughs> yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, um, sister, <laughs> for the invitation. Um, I want to um, um, congratulate you because of the three years of the group. I saw when it started as a baby and now it's huge and it has done a lot of impact in Nigeria, in Africa. So I am so happy for being here. I, I really appreciate it. Um, soon. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you is uh, and yes, Eva is my supervisor. So I was so lucky that she saw the post that she applied, and now she's coming on Saturday. I am so excited. <laughs> so I am assistant professor of animal welfare and behavior at the University of Calgary. I am originally from Colombia, South America, right? Uh, when I decided that I wanted to work with animal welfare and behavior it was like in 2010 at that time colombia doesn't have anything uh, about animal welfare behavior like it wasn't even taught in at the university it was not in the curriculum so i i wanted to deepen that so i went to brazil to do a masters and the professor who i work with he he's very well recognized in Latin America. And I started knowing, like being just as a student, right? And being with him, I, I met, he, he used to bring a lot of researchers in our research group to give us uh, classes. For example, uh, Don Broom, Linda Keeling, uh, Xavier Manteca. So, I started knowing people in the research area and I am a very extroverted person. So I was always like, hey, I want you to read my paper. I Can I ask you things? Can I ask you questions? So I know that not everybody has that, um, that characteristic, but try to don't be shy. Like if you are with somebody that you want uh, your help, uh, his help or her help that you want to meet, just go there. In our research file, in animal welfare and behavior, everybody's super nice. So nobody's going to look you at you like, uh, who are you? Why are you coming here? No, everybody's super open. So I started like learning those things when I was in my master's, right? Then I finished my master and I started my PhD. I, I work uh, with um, cattle temperament, right? In my PhD, I really uh, got passionate about human-animal interaction. In my research group at that time, uh, Professor Paranios, he, he, he didn't work too much on that. So um, I wanted to contact people in that research file because uh, he said, Maria, we can go ahead. I know you are able to do it. Uh, let's 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 go, right? So I started writing my project and I saw that I needed information from people that Professor Materos didn't know. So I say, hey, Professor, I want to contact this and this and this researcher because they have this um, uh, service that they have done to, because he's super expert in the, uh, behavior and animal welfare, but in the human part, he didn't have so much experience. So I wanted to just contact people who has done that. I said, yes, Maria, go ahead. So I was a student and I wrote an email to Xavier Boydin in France, to um, uh, Paul Hensworth in Australia, and I say, Hi, my name is Maria. I am a student at the University of Sao Paulo State University. My, my project is about this, 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 this. And I really want to know if you can 
please help me send me some service or things like that. And they were super nice. And for example, Sarah Boivin, we now still collaborate. He said that the project was super interesting, that he, he really liked the idea, that uh, he was open to do collaboration. So I started a collaboration between our research group in France. He was part of my uh, or of my project. He sent me the the service that he made, and we did that collaboration. And now in North Macedonia, we meet for the first time in person, and we are going to work in another project. So network, right? I was not afraid just to send emails around. You may have answers saying, "Hey, no, I cannot help you," or "Hey." here is the paper or even you won't have answers, right? I remember then when I was uh, at the stage where I can apply for a, a internship, right? And I wanted to do, to deep my knowledge on human animal interaction. So I contacted Paul Hensworth and he's well, one of the most recognized uh, uh, researchers in the area of human animal interaction and animal welfare. And I say, hey, Professor Hens, well, I have the opportunity to apply for a, a scholarship here in Brazil, and I really would like to go there. And I remember I sent emails to people who, had, who, who were working in the research line or what I wanted to deep on, right? And I remember this was this research, and I am not going to say the name, that I sent. So I sent like email to three professors to Professor Hensworth, to this person, and I don't remember who else. And so I sent the email to Hensworth and to this researcher who I sent the email and I received an auto reply saying, um, hi, I am a very busy person and selected to answer uh, emails. Do not expect me to answer, something like that. Uh, but that person was not so known as, for example, Hensworth, right? And I was like, hmm, okay. And Paul, he answered me. He said, hey, Maria, this is interesting. Yes, please let me know what you need to apply. So he sent me the letters that I needed to apply for the scholarship. I went there. I learned a lot with his research group. Uh, again, and, and he and Mateus, that is the supervisor in Brazil, he never met before. So it's not because, oh, yes, uh, because most of the time uh, we as, uh, for example, in, now I say we because now I am that stage. But when I was a, a student, right, uh, my supervisor always, when he knew somebody, I was, hey, professor, please put me in contact with this person. He always did that, right? So I am going to do that, but sometimes I, I don't know everybody, right? So I will encourage my students, go ahead, see, uh, write them. So I wrote to them. So two people that my supervisor didn't have network yet, I started a collaboration, right? So first, first um, uh, tip, don't be afraid to send emails. Don't be afraid to contact people. People will always like, uh, be, I mean, you. what I always say to my mother teach me, taught me that, and I teach that to my students. They know you always have. If you don't send the email, you will have the no, right? If you send the email or if you contact the person, there is a chance for a yes, right? So go ahead. No, don't be afraid. I, but he's super recognized. He's super busy. He won't answer me. You just write the email. And the same for, for example, applying for the scholarships and things like that. I am super competitive. I won't get it. You don't know if you don't apply. If you do the, 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 the grant or the, the application, you will learn how to do an application. Even if you don't get it, you get experience and then you can apply again, right? But I, I now let's go, go back to the network. Now, that is how I started as a student then. I started going to conferences, right? And when I went, when I was finishing my PhD, I got an award to go to, it was to Denmark. 
It was in Denmark. No, to, yeah, Denmark. And I went there and I wanted a postdoc. So I went with my mind like, okay, I'm finishing my PhD and I want a, a postdoc. So I am going to sell myself. <laughs> And I went there and of course, like by the end of my PhD, I already knew some of the researchers because of my supervisor and all of this. So I started with them. So, hey, uh, um, I am looking for a postdoc. I am finishing my PhD. So I was informing the people that I already knew oh, for a postdoc, right? Um, just to tell them, do you know somebody or something else? And then I knew, that there were, for example, the ISAE have these uh, um, programs for students, like uh, eating with ethologists. So I choose to eat with somebody that I knew that, uh, that was working in what I wanted. So I went there, hi, my name is Maria, I am Nana, I am looking for a postdoc. And every person that I met, hi, my name is Maria, how are you? So I have to work with this, 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 I am looking for a postdoc and things like that. And how I got my, my the position for my postdoc, it was because I I already knew Ruth Newberry, and I told her like, hey Ruth, I am looking for a postdoc, and she said, oh, okay, you know, if I know something. So she came to me and she said, eh, Maria, do you would you like to do a postdoc with pigs? And my first thought was, I never like pigs. Like I am passionate about cattle. My first thought was, pigs, no. I don't want it, but I was fast and I say, pigs, hmm, that sounds interesting, why? And she said like, ah, there is a colleague that is looking for a post. So come here and I will present you, uh, he, his name is Thomas. So I was lucky that I just uh, presented, I, I got an oral presentation in that, in, that, um, in that meeting and he was there. So he saw me presenting and he said like, hey, Maria, your project was super interesting. I think with the, with the experience that you have, uh, uh, you can do the project even if it is with pigs. And he started and he told me all the information. I was like, yes, yes, of course, super interesting. And we spoke, we spoke, we spoke. He gave me his card. So when I went back, I was in Australia when I went there. When I got back to Australia, I had like, I don't know, seven cards from people that I was saying like, hey, my name is Maria, I am looking for a postdoc. And they were like, yes, yes, send me an email on your CV. And I started with all of them and I left like at the end, that one, because it was with pics. And everybody was like, hi, Maria, I am applying for a grant. Please contact me in six months when I have the answer. Or hi, Maria, I am super proud. I want you to come here, but you need to go that scholarship, see if you can get something in Brazil or in Colombia or things like that. And this guy, he sent me an email this size. He said, Maria, your, your, your CV is perfect for this project. And he explained all the projects. He offered me the, the position without any like interview, anything. And I was like, oh my God, with pigs. I think, I think, I think a lot about if I wanted to work with pigs. But at the end, I, I decided to go because I said, okay, pigs is one of the people that, oh, the people know of the animal production animals that more um, welfare problems have because it's so intensive. It's the same as poultry, right? Uh, so I ended up saying yes, and I went there, and it was super, super, super good. I really enjoyed and learned a lot, so I am super happy that I got that opportunity. How? Networking. Then I went to Norway, and I met Seun, and... <laughs> She was so shy and she was like, hi, Maria, I, I want to, to meet somebody. Uh, we'd like to do a postdoc. And I, do you want a postdoc? Okay. I grab her hand and say, I know this guy, this guy, this guy, they are looking for postdocs. Let's go. She was like, no, 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 nothing. Let's come. So I was less shy now. Like I already got a little bit of experience. So I told her, you need to sell yourself. Go there. Come, come. And I did only once. Hey, this is Seoul. She's looking for a postdoc. I will let you go, guys speak. And then she went, and now she's, I think, even better than me. So don't be afraid. Don't be shy, right? Networking is a really important part of our careers, right? Uh, now, as a 
researcher here at the university. I have started projects in different places with different countries, uh, researchers from different places like that. So that is that is the experience that I had to share with you. I really hope you 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 take some tips. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Well, thank you for sharing your personal experience. And I can see that it was the way you were uh, handled. It was the same way you, you handled me when we met in Norway. And she just grabbed my hand. She went, okay, let's start moving. Oh, this, she needs this, she needs I was like, oh, I can't even talk. Thank you so much. And <laughs> I'm very good at that now. I know. <laughs> so now we are open for comments. We are open for feedbacks. So you are free to turn on your video. If you have any comment for anybody or you just want to express yourself as well, please indicate by the raise of hand button and I will unmute you, please. This is the time to interact, to know ourselves. Don't be shy. Like Maria said, just say it anyhow it comes or send that email yeah, to, to that person. You never can say that may be, you just need a one yes. You can get several no's, but that one yes, you don't know who will tell you yes. So please turn on your video. We have, uh, I think 15, I'll hand over to uh, Samuel Duro Sharo to help, please. So I, so I just rest a bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed uh, the third anniversary. But there is one thing I want you to know before we start. If you want anything you want to present on Animal Welfare Group 2000, in 2023, please, when we share the link, do so on time because these days we don't have slots for presentations again. <laughs> so it's so important because we have so many people all over the world that want to present on Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. So please, uh, we will soon share this uh, link. So if you are interested, just do so on time, please. So if you want to say anything, you can signify by raising up of hand. I think uh, Fami uh, has already- uh, Fami, you want to say some things? Fami is from Indonesia. Uh, Dr. Yasser, you have to unmute. Oh, good. Okay. Fami, you can talk. Clear? Okay, uh, firstly, I want to thank you for the opportunity and I would like to say congratulations to the Trias for the group. Well, actually, yeah, my name is Fahmi and I came from Indonesia. Well, this is actually 10 p.m. So this night, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, okay, April 24, 2022 it was the first time that I got my uh, message from Dr. Yes and I keep it on my lanyard and it's just <laughs> like oh my god Dr. Yes the first non-Indonesian to approach me oh. in the way of uh, academic and also research so I was I was like oh I feel honored so okay and then and at uh, on May 11 2022 it's, that is the first time that I talked to Dr. Yas uh, uh, on WhatsApp call. And it was, okay, I have motivation and that we shared uh, about the chickens, indigenous chicken in Indonesia. So yeah, well, actually I'm working for wildlife conservation management and research. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, my master's degree in that field and graduated last October. So yeah, now I'm working for a, a research project with a researcher from Cornell University from the US uh, working on um, ornithological ethnoconservation. So yeah, ethnoconservation is one of the important thing in Indonesia because here in Indonesia, birds and other animals like cattle and also um, goats and also sheep is it's not only a farming, it's not only a life, livestock, it is our culture because yeah, uh, everything, uh, every morning here, uh, we can found um, birds in cages held in front of our houses. And it's like, it is a common for us as Indonesians, but my project leader is 
yeah, curious about it and do a research on it. So I joined it. And yeah, we have found so many uh, stories and that story is actually inspired by Dr. Ia's uh, stories and also this group uh, sharing in this group. So I was like, I always want to join this group, but yeah, the time is not the same because yeah, when the group is having a meeting, online meeting uh, here in Indonesia, we are night, we are at night. So yeah, I have to spend my time, but it's okay. So yeah, I really want to thank a lot. And I may be, maybe I am the, the only Indonesian to join this group, am I? Or is there other or not Indonesian? I don't know. But uh, yeah, it is a privilege for me to know the stories from Nigeria, from Africa and all over the world. And so, yeah, I hope that I can also share my stories from animal welfare here in Indonesia because yeah, talking about wildlife conservation research and management, we just talk about the habitat and also the, the poaching, the, the hunting and also habitat uh, degradations and destructions. In Indonesia, we uh, animal welfare is just a rare, uh, a rare field to be able to implement it in conservation, in wildlife conservation. So I would like, uh, I think I want to, um, yeah, take animal welfare into the conservation uh, management and research because it is very important. Animal welfare is not only important for the farming of our livestock, but it is all important for wildlife conservation and research. So yeah, being able to be in this group is a privilege, uh, whether I'm not African, I'm not Nigerian, I'm from Indonesia and far away from Nigeria. And it is, yeah, I, I also share why my stories uh, from this group to my mom, yeah, here in Indonesia, and also to my friends that I'm, yeah, I'm joining a, a animal welfare group in Nigeria. And also uh, uh, told my supervisor at, Bandung Institute of Technology, uh, my bachelor's and master's uh, supervisor that I'm joining this group. And I have, yeah, Dr. Ias as, <laughs> as the main uh, person of this group. And she was like, oh, oh great. You have to broaden your uh, connectivity. So yeah, I really happy to join this group and uh, seeing every stories from different backgrounds. So yeah, thank you, Dr. Yas, and thank you, everyone. It's enough. Dr. Yas, thank you for sending that message to FAMI. Uh, FAMI, you have the whole of Indonesia to yourself. We also started uh, in a very small way. If I tell you some of our stories, you are going to laugh. And there was a day Dr. Yas broke our phone because of this animal welfare group presentation. I've shouted on a lot of people <laughs> whenever I'm hosting this meeting and I have somebody knocking on my door after I've tasted that I'm in a meeting, I used to shout. <laughs> so, so we started very small, but we thank God uh, we are better. So uh, Gideon, you want to say something? Gideon, uh, or mute yourself. Gideon, are you with us? Please take Tele first, then I will mute Gideon. Okay, good. So, Again. Dr. David, in two minutes, I know you are great, so you can talk for the whole day. <laughs> <Not two minutes. laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, after Dr. Drew, I should be the next disciple of uh, Dr. Yasiri. <laughs> well, I really appreciate her doggedness about this uh, animal welfare group in Nigeria. And uh, sincerely, yours. She she can convert any any anybody anybody anybody, so so she has done a good job at least uh, to even have somebody like me still be coming online. <laughs> uh, I'm supposed to be in a place this morning, but I just said I come. You guys put it on hold. I will come after this meeting. So I want to appreciate her, appreciate everybody who have been working to make sure this bodies moving and one thing i've just discovered that uh we are likely to even still have more problems uh what i mean is 
try uh, in terms of advocacy, governments, uh, this thing. But we should not be discouraged because for sure, don't be surprised if you have some people somewhere else who will be trying to fund between this body and government policies and government uh, parastatals that are supposed to buy our ideas. Uh, but we should just be courageous to keep doing what we are doing. Uh, this is just the third year. We're going to have the sixth year. We're going to have the seventh year. <clears throat> and maybe by the time Dr. Yase will be Professor Emeritus, you will say, wow, I have achieved. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. David. That was, that was interesting. That, that, was, that was more or less a speech, a motivation to Dr. Yase and the rest of us. Uh, please, I would love to encourage people to write posts on LinkedIn. Uh, about animal welfare on Facebook, uh, tweet about animal welfare, tag animal welfare group Nigeria. You don't know if you are going to meet someone that will collaborate with you. Honestly, we all need this. We all need collaboration. Before I invite Gideon to talk, let me tell you my own experience in 30 seconds. In 2020, Dr. Yase just said, oh, can, can I, I met somebody in 2019 that is working on turkey behavior. And you are working on turkey genetics. Uh, let's, let's try and talk to her. Let's try and have a meeting. That is how I met uh, Dr. Erasmus. We have a meeting. We started talking. And lo and behold, I'm doing postdoc with her in the uh, United States now. So you don't know who you are going to meet. So uh, Gideon, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, Gideon. Oh, you have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good everyone. We're actually in the morning here. I'm a master student in the US at Purdue University. And the first time I joined this group was in February. I attended the ISA conference in conjunction with the Ministry of Agri, where I actually learned a lot. And one thing I love about this group is the diversity and the ability to see and in welfare from two standpoints, from international setting and also from the indigenous aspects, obviously from Nigeria and Africa. And I think one of the highlights for me for this semester is turning a term paper on animal welfare in Nigeria and Ghana. And my professor was so happy you know, to also see the status of animal welfare from developing countries. So. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Gideon. Thank you for joining the meeting uh, sponsored by DCAF and Open Philanthropy, the one that was held in Abuja, uh, Federal Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. Uh, Gideon is, we are, myself and Gideon, we are in the same lab in Purdue. So, uh, Sahid, two minutes. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me, please? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here, honestly. And um, I think I am aware of the whole story of how the animal welfare group Nigeria started. Yes, I was not part of the foundation, but I think I joined the train very early. And um, I cannot but uh, you know appreciate and commend the you know the courage and the, uh, you know, the struggle that uh, Dr. Iyas and Dr. Duro have gone through. And I was opportune to, to work with the group of them, maybe for maybe one or two months. But that one or two months, I actually learned a lot in terms of you know, working together, collaboration, you know, being dedicated about what you're doing. You know, it, it was actually a very fun time. And um, I'm happy that today, the animal welfare group Nigeria is three years, and I can only wish you guys more success. Honestly, you're doing well, but you have not even started. Because uh, I look, yeah, because in recent times there was an idea conceived by, I think, uh, Dr. Yas, myself, and Dr. Drew. And I was telling her that to bring animal welfare in Nigeria to limelight, you need to publish a paper in top journal like nature, whether nature conservation, whether nature ecology or something. Yes, let them know it, it has to be a collective effort of animal welfare, you know, experts from Nigeria. If you put a lot of authors on it, it is going to command respect. And before you know it, you know, AWG in Nigeria is also, you know, going higher. So I'm also using this medium to, to challenge everyone. 
not only Dr. Yasede. I know she's quite involved in a lot of things. But if you are a member of this group, please always remind her that you, there's a need to, you know, to, to bring up a comprehensive paper that will tell us the status of animal welfare in Nigeria, where we are, where we are before. I believe there's a template on that already. Yeah. And, um, you know, I am also, I'm not an animal welfare person per se, but by extension, uh, I'm a member you know, of an association. And I think my master's work actually focused on, uh, on, my, on animal welfare, a, a part of it. And uh, one of my guys is uh, luckily just finished speaking. Uh, you understand? So, so since then, I've been interested in animal welfare, actually. Though I've not been doing much more research on it, but even at that, I am still very much interested and you know, open to collaboration. And is that experience still lives with me. And I believe Dr. Yas is still trying to drag me and you know, encouraging me. Yes, she has warned me, but she has not, she, she just needs to do more. <laughs> regarding that. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And um, I wish every one of us, uh, you know, more success in our, in our endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Said. Thank you for that wonderful comment. So, Dr. Yas, we need to work on that paper. We have to let people know what AWGN stands for, how we started, where we are, and what we do. So, thank you for the reminder. Uh, okay, Baba Lola, Barnabas is here. So, unmute yourself, Barnabas. Okay, we have you. Uh, Last two minutes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Barnabas from um, and um, I'm an undergraduate. Yeah. One thing um, I would say about this animal welfare thing is um, I got to know about animal welfare during my 300 level year. Um, currently, I'm in 400 level, and um, there was an aspect, um, Dr. Mrs. yesterday, she, she um, conducted then. So it was during that time that um, she took the class that I began to show interest in um, animal welfare. And um, she has been doing a lot, talk of um, uh, giving us um, different uh, avenues to, to do uh, animal-related um, activities. There was a time when um, the undergraduate students and some of them, um, the, the postgraduate went to zoo together. They also organized um, animal welfare um, panel discussions, something like that. And um, it has been a very, very uh, impactful uh, experience to me personally. And um, that has even changed my orientation. Like I, I, I'm, I'm determined that, okay, during my postgraduate um, uh, project, I'll be going into animal welfare and behavior fully. And um, I really, really appreciate um, our efforts and Dr. Drews and uh, Shari also. Thank you very much. You are doing excellently well. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Barnabas. That is inspiring. And uh, I'm so happy that you have found interest in animal welfare and behavior. And we expect you to see you doing masters in that. Uh, do we have any other person that wants to say something? One or two people before we end the meeting. We have Hazan Mustafa. Here. Oh, Hazan, can you please unmute yourself? If possible, let us see your face. If it is not convenient, no problem about your face. So you have the floor, Hazan. Good evening, sir. Good, evening. good, good morning from United States. Good evening over there. Yeah, evening to my Nigeria colleagues and greetings to everyone from all part of the world. I'm from Mustafa. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, especially the participants and the organizers for this great move. Actually, I've been following Doctor for a very long time. I was fortunate to attend one of the webinars during my service here. Uh, Actually, taught her my experience about uh, animal welfare. Currently, I'm back to Ninja State where I'm born, and I'm looking forward to start the move. But I realize it's not something I, if I will be able to join the, 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 the larger body, maybe from then I will be able to get some support to start the movement around here. 
thank you very much. And I also look forward to start my master's in animal welfare. Oh, that's, that's a good one, Azam. You have the whole of Niger State to yourself. So, explore it. It's a good one. Do we have another person that wants to say something? One person? Okay, if you want to say anything, you can signify by the raising up of hand. So, in the absence of people that want to talk, I would love to hand over to Dr. Yasseri to end the meeting. And we we'll see you next year. As soon we are going to bring out the link for presentation. And if you want to present something that is a little bit different from research, maybe you want to talk about animal welfare in the concept of journalism or some other things, uh, be free to let us know. So Dr. Yasseri, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I want to thank everybody for making our time to be uh, part of this uh, uh, third year anniversary. Actually, <laughs> I'm just smiling. But I really thank God for how far he has helped us. And uh, knowing that at least we have you guys join our meeting makes it really uh, interesting for us because